The Coin Week podcast is brought to you by PCGS, the official grading service of the Tyrant Collection and of the SS Central America Shipwreck Gold Coins. For more information, visit PCGS.com. In this episode of the podcast, we talk to a 50-year industry veteran and legendary coin dealer and auctioneer, Ira Goldberg. Ira has handled almost every major rarity that you can think of, but one of the crowning achievements of his career is the work he has put in over the past 15 years to assemble one of the most valuable and wide-ranging coin collections ever assembled, the Tyrant Collection. I got a chance to see some of the Tyrant coins at the Long Beach Expo, and I asked Ira to be our guest today to talk about it. Hi, Ira. Thank you for joining me on the Coin Week podcast. Thank you, Charles. My pleasure. You know, traveling the country, as we both seem to do for a living, you come to think that you know enough about coins so that when you come to a coin show, you'll you pretty much know what to expect. But I was totally floored when I saw your beautiful and very elegantly assembled selection of important English coins that you have named the Tyrants of the Thames which is the first portion of the valuable globe-spanning Tyrant Collection. So first, I want to congratulate you on raising the bar on what a numismatic exhibit of this caliber could look like in a public setting. And second, I'd love to get your personal insights into the collection and, and what it was that the uh, convention goers got the rare opportunity to take in. Well, I, I appreciate that. This is a collection... Uh that I've been working on for about 15 years with a client. Uh, he's known as the Tyrant. And uh, we're going to be showing different parts every uh, different Long Beach. I've committed for three years. So there's, uh, there's let's see, uh, four Long Beach coin shows a year. So it's 12 exhibits, and each one will be different. And the theme of the collection is, uh, of course, uh, Tyrants. And we've tied it into uh, bodies of water. For example, this one is uh, Tyrants of the Thames, and the next one might be the ty Tyrants of the Tigris Euphrates, or it could be Tyrants of the Nile, or it could be Tyrants of the Aegean, uh, or maybe Tyrants of the Seine, like that. Because if you think about it, the first thing that a tyrant does upon obtaining power or conquer land, or their, their portrait, or their badge. And this has been going on since the beginning of coins, uh, 7th century B.C. until today. So uh, it really covers, uh, it covers all the civilizations, and that's what we're trying to, uh, to show here. It is, uh, it is, uh, it's, we're looking, and what we've done is not necessarily fill in every hole, all that's certainly the goal, but to pick museum quality coins. And I've been fortunate enough to uh, be able to assist with this and have a collector who, who really enjoys and loves what he's doing. And then I have uh, a staff and we decided to, if we're going to show this, we want to do it unlike any coin exhibit that's ever been done. Make it really easy to view with state-of-the-art lighting and with information so a school kid or uh, someone who has, say, for example, in this English collection, has no in, no real knowledge of English history or doesn't even know what's available, they can come and spend hours viewing. That That's the idea. And that's why we went into such detail in showing it and having a catalog of, uh, of everything that's in the exhibit. It was absolutely fascinating. You know, there are coins in this exhibit that, that I'm quite sure have never been on public display. Uh, there are coins on exhibit that, for all intents and purposes, are uncollectible, uh, unique, or uh, very few known examples. So how does somebody decide that they want to build a collection like this? I mean, it, it's so broad and so deep. I mean, I know all it takes is one coin sometimes to start a journey, but... Was the collector's original intent to build what we now know as the Tyrant Collection? Really, it came about 
um, because actually the tyrant uh, is anything but a tyrant. I mean, he himself is a he's a very soft-spoken individual, uh, somewhat shy, and doesn't want the notoriety uh, or the problems associated with notoriety with an important and valuable collection. But about 15 years ago, uh, he had a nice collection of American coins, and I think he wanted to branch out. And I stressed to him, as I would any collector, the natural tendency for a new collector is to buy as many coins as he can. Okay, and it's especially true with people who collect Greek or Roman. Uh, they want as many coins for their numismatic dollars they can get. In fact, it's not the wise move. We, uh, the wise and uh, the, uh, the best way to go about it is to buy the most important coins first in the best possible condition. And you're much better off with one coin than you are with ten. But you learn that, and no matter how often you hear it said, it's the uh, – every collector does the same thing. So he agreed that let's, I re, let's pick out the rarities, the toughest coins in the group to get, and we can always build around that. And that's what we've done. For the last 15 years, I've, I've traveled all over the globe. I've been in virtually every major coin auction uh, and have slowly put this together without, you know, without uh, really anybody knowing. So when we put it out on display, people – People have no idea this, this stuff was here. I mean, there's, there's, there are a number of unique coins in, in each of these exhibits. And it's been a lot of fun for me. It's a culmination of my career. I've been in this business 55 years, and uh, I've, uh, I've built some wonderful collections like the Millennia Collection, you know, and Goodman's uh, Collections, and, 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 brought a lot, and Hessel Guessers, and brought a lot of wonderful material to, to market, including a lot of celebrities' collections, but nothing. Uh, will match this. You know, before we get back to the uh, particulars about some of the coins on display, I really wanted to compliment you personally. Um, there aren't too many coin dealers that I know, or, or even professional numismatists who are active today, who uh, excel in such a wide range of numismatic interest, you know, from ancient coins to, to world coins in U.S. Uh, you know, I think that we live in a time of specialization in our hobby, and that brings with it, of course, some benefits. But talking to you over the years as I have and doing several segments with you, uh, you know, you really, really know your stuff and command an immense wealth of knowledge. And I think that that really shows in a collection like this. And, uh, and it also shows in the ease with which, you know, you talk about these coins to the public. You know, at, at the Long Beach show, when, when this uh, exhibit was on display, I talked to a number of dealers who, who were very impressed with what you had on display, but, but who also knew virtually nothing about English coins. Thank you very much, Charles. It's really what's kept my feet in the, uh, the fire all these years. Like I said, I've been at it 55 years, and I still get a thrill out of it out of finding coins and learning. I'm all constantly reading, and uh, it's, uh, I'll probably be reading and, and studying the, the series and looking for coins uh, on my deathbed. Hopefully it's not for a while, but uh, it's, it, it's what drives me. I have that drive. Uh, I had it when I was younger. I was an athlete, and I still am. Uh, I still consider it the, uh, the amount of moving around and the, uh, the competition and the search. Uh, it's, it's like a treasure hunt. I'm a, still a little kid at heart, but I'm, I very much appreciate that. I, I do pride myself in being a, an old-time numismatist, and I, there aren't many areas that I don't have at least some knowledge in. So what kind of preparation or, or special research did it take for you, you know, even with your breadth of knowledge, to build a collection like this? I mean, this collection, I, I'm sure, contained more than a few coins that you probably hadn't encountered before. Well, really, my day will start. Uh, I probably get uh, ten, a half a dozen to a dozen catalogs a day from around the world. And I spend a good portion of my day just going through the various catalogs. Some of them are not even on, you know, uh, uh, in hand. Some of them are online. But I go, try to go through every major or every auction and see what's available, what's being offered, and select from there. 
and then there are certain areas that we're we're still building on, and I don't want to mention because it may cost me more money. But uh, when we're finished with each group, or gone as far as we can, uh, always looking for better quality, uh, then we'll start showing it, and we're publishing a, a book with each one. So let's go over some of the highlights of the display. You know, I tried to film as much as I could, but it, it was busy, and and I know I, I didn't get a chance to film everything. Uh, so when it comes to the Tyrants of the Thames, uh, what were some of your favorite coins, and uh, which of the coins were the Tyrants' uh, favorite? Uh, good question. I I think if I had a favorite coin, I mean, each and what's interesting also are the stories behind them. Uh, I had a, um, a client who once a year uh, sold me a coin at the New York International, an English coin, and he searched me out about a dozen years ago, and uh, he says, "Ira, I'll sell you one coin a year." I, you know, I just uh, that's it. He was a um, in the brokerage business, and he says, "If you turn me down, then I'm going to go to someone else." But you have first shot because he he uh, we got along well and he had a good reputation. So he takes me into his bank vault. And he says, here's the first coin. And it was a um, Elizabeth the first ship Rael, a spur Rael. You know, it has a spur on the reverse, and, and uh, Queen Elizabeth the first is sitting in the ship. So it's about the size of, uh, of um, a noble. I took one look at this coin, and I was sipping on a cup of coffee, and I spilled it all over myself. Her portrait literally jumps out of, off, off the coin. You've, I've never seen a portrait of Queen Elizabeth, anything like this. Uh, and it's a spur Isle, which happens to be one of the great rarities in the English series. So this was the first coin I started with. And, and uh, for the next 10 years, I bought 10 coins from him. Each one was incredible, with uh, fabulous uh, pedigrees dating back several hundred years. So that really, because it's a coin that I really uh, got so excited about, it's probably my favorite all the tyrants' favorite, I think, would probably be, uh, and it has nothing to do with the money, but I think his favorite coin would be uh, either the uh, Edward VIII set. Of course, it's the only one on the complete set in private hands. I think he paid the most for that than anything. But also, he the uh, the John Lennon coin uh, is it, a coin that was issued in 2010. It has on the obverse. Uh, you know, Queen Elizabeth II, uh, and the reverse, uh, John Lennon, he was knighted. And so 5,000 were made by the Royal Mint in silver and sold out immediately, and one was struck for, uh, for his wife, Yoko Ono, and she gave it to the Children's Museum in Liverpool. So uh, he had to have the coin, because first of all, it's a coin, not a medal. That was a coin made uh, uh, with a denomination. And it fits all the, the reasons for a coin. And we were able to buy it out of auction for really next to nothing. So I think he got a, he got a big thrill out of that. But, you know, there's so many historical coins in there that, uh, uh, that, the, the, what about the Charles I, uh, the, the Triple Unite? It's the largest gold coin of England. And, and on the reverse, he's got his famous proclamation, you know, that he will, uh, give liberty, uh, and justice and, 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 and fair treatment to the to the Protestants, and that he will allow the legislature to uh, uh, make the acts, and he you know he'll change his course. And of course, what happened was uh, he d didn't do any of those things, and he was beheaded. And you have the Civil War. So uh, coins like that are just really amazing. But and then also the uh, the gold trimisma of uh, of the first coin, uh, the King of Kent. Uh, Edibald. It's the uh, first coin ever to name its issuing king. And, uh, I mean, that's a great coin to start with. So, uh, I mean, that's just a, a, a touch on them. But the, the run of uh, the proof, Charles II, five guineas, the first proof gold coin, uh, uh, maybe predated by the uh, Oliver Cromwell uh, uh, broad as being in proof condition. So th those are very historical and really a, a lot of fun, and, and the search is, is ongoing. But those are 
some of my favorites, and I think the, uh, the Tyrant's favorites also. Do you have any idea how this portion of the collection might rate, you know, compared to the uh, amazing collection of English coins that are impounded in the British Museum? Well, I think the British Museum will have a much better collection because they have everything, including the, the actual uh, double uh, triple unite which was presented to uh, it was presented to uh, the exchequer when he was beheaded. So I know you know there's some pretty good coins there. But I would say in private hands, I can't think of any collection uh, that really has prob that has more value. This English collection may well be the certainly is the best outside of England. But there, I don't think that. Uh, well, there's no other collection would have the an Edward VIII set complete, so they they couldn't be complete from every coin issue. Nor could they have the uh, uh, the double leopard. That's probably the single most expensive coin. Would be the double leopard, which is the coin of Edward III, struck for a short period in 1344, uh, really as a uh, uh, the last of the Plagenets, really the earliest, among the earliest English gold coins there is. Uh, England is growing. Uh, the Middle Ages, the time of uh, chivalry, you have uh, uh, King Arthur and the, uh, the the Round Table. It's all the same period, the Knights of the Round Table. And he issues this coin called the Double Leopard so that it will compete with the, with the Flemish coins and the French coins of the period, and to have an international coinage. Uh, it was unaccepted. And uh, so what happened was, several years later, he issues the famous noble, heavier and a little slightly larger, and it became the standard coin of the realm for, you know, two, three hundred years. But the double leopard uh, was, because it's the only one in private hands, uh, I don't know how a better collection could be formed. That plus the the uh, Edward VIII set and, and the other great rarities. So uh, I would imagine. Well, he, he most recently he bought the uh, the silver uh, Simon Petition coin to set the record price for the most amount of money ever paid for an English silver coin. He bought the uh, the fifth known example of the famous Simon Petition coin that was issued by Charles II showing his petition on the edge, and that coin was uh, minted in uh, 1663. So uh, I, don't see another, I don't see another collection that would contain that, plus the most amount of money ever paid for an English hammered coin, which is the Charles I silver pound um, in incredible condition. So I would think that this collection that I had on display is worth somewhere between 15 and 20 million. That's my guess. There's a lot of important coins in this collection. And the fun for me is to search. So are you going to be able to tease us uh, as to what section of the collection will be on display at the Long Beach show in June or, or maybe even uh, spoil a surprise or two and uh, tell us about some of the very important and unexpected pieces that are going to turn up in the Tyrant collection? Well, I don't know what I'm going to do. I have a meeting this coming Friday with the tyrant, and we're going to talk about – I'm kind of thinking that maybe the next one we should do is tyrants of the Seine, because, uh, I mean, it's, you'll start with uh, uh, Merovingian, the ancient French. The, uh, we'll go into the Carolingian, and they're going to go into the feudal French period and through the uh, Napoleonic period, and then ending uh, with, you know, modern France, independent France. I don't know, because maybe we'll mix in, uh, we'll use the early Merovingian, Carolingian, and stop at uh, Napoleonic, and then show the show the uh, the American coins that circulated during that time. We could do that also with the exhibit. So we haven't really settled on what, what the next one will be, uh, Charles. I just don't know. Well, I, I'll tell you that personally, I look forward to seeing the next part of the Tyrant Collection. Uh, you know, what you and your team have put together is so well done and so interesting. And I thank you and the Tyrant Collector for sharing it with us. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, I hope to be talking to you soon. All right. Thanks, Ira. I job.
If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with your friends. And remember, you can download all 90 plus episodes of the Coin Week podcast for free from the iTunes store. For Coin Week, I'm editor Charles Morgan. Until next time, happy collecting.